guys, uh, it's all yours. Let's let it rip. Well, we are Squawking Dead, a podcast all of our rising episodes beyond the Walking Dead universe. I'm your host, Dave Cameo. We've got Punky Rooster, that's ko-nation.com slash Punky Rooster, that's beyond K-O-N-A-S-E-T-E-R. Woo! You sound pretty good at that. Thank you. And we're here to announce uh, the Reapers panel with Robert Torelli Hayes as Wells and Ethan McDowell as Washington. Come on in, boys! We did a charity thing. I sometimes forget details. Robert, <laughs> gentlemen, raised a lot of money for some kids. Um, the, what was the charity again? Uh, the, uh, what, what are you referring to exactly? So um, we did a charity uh, giveaway, a uh, trivia. Charity. Oh, the trivia. Yeah, that's right. So you, oh, yeah. You raised money for, um, it was, so my, my mother, fun fact, my mother is a foster care and adoption recruiter. You're talking about trivia night. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's a hat. Foster care and adoption recruiter, and um, so I, you know, I just have a, uh, a soft spot for children who are in need of a family, and we like to call them forever homes. So that's what my mother does. She she searches and scouts for forever homes for for children who don't have a family or have a home. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm going to be honest. It, sometimes it's really hard to talk about myself and you know charity work that I do because I, I kind of like to be under the radar and not really speak about those things. I, I like to just do them without, you know, speaking on them. Um, but yeah, that's just a little, yeah, it's too late. The cat is out of the bag now. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, cat is out of the bag. But, uh, but yeah, we ended up doing a, a trivia night, which I wasn't the best at. I, I thought I knew a lot more about The Walking Dead until you, uh, you know, you, until we shaved you face off against, against, no. against true, diehard fans of the show and I'm like, gosh, I did not know that um, Carl ate this um, amount of ounces of chocolate pudding. I had no idea. Like, <laughs> but, but yeah, that was such a fun night. To your credit, you took everything like a champ and, and I, I tried so, so much more respect. I, I was so embarrassed. I'm like, man, I, I suck at this. It didn't show. <laughs> that That's pearly whites made everything better. <laughs> Do I need to ask questions, or do you all just want to look at them for a half hour? Let's look at both of these ladies. <laughs> 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 uh, you were Reapers. You wore some cool masks. You had a backstory. What was that backstory? Did you guys build like a world for yourself? You know, as an actor, so you could come into the show with a with a little bit more because it was a it was like a Mack truck. Y'all came in, right? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I feel because we we wouldn't get full script or anything like that, so you don't really know like what the characters are. You just know that they're a force to be reckoned with. A little bit of a military background, so as actors we kinda just have to form that. And I think a lot of it comes from the wardrobe as well. So Vera Chow, who was the wardrobe supervisor, would purposely mix and match different elements of like military type tactical uh, 
the hoods, the vests, the pants, but everybody had their own elements, so like not, we weren't actually uniform military people. It's as if we took different military uniforms over the years of survival and put it all together and became who we were. But I think like putting that on then informs us as an actor, like, okay, we're serious, we're really serious. Which none of us were, any of the Reapers, if you meet any of us in real life, everybody's just a sweetheart and real nice people. But then you see us on screen and we're just, Terrifying. Terrifying. <laughs> but honestly, like, if it was up to me, if, um, you know, someone came to me and said, hey, would you rather play a good guy or a bad guy on The Walking Dead? I would pick a bad guy, you know? But it's funny because, you know, I've, I've been a fan of the show since, you know, the pilot was released. And, um, like, while I was filming, I would kind of, like, root against myself, you know, because I, you know, I, you know, I would do my scenes and whatnot and be completely immersed into the character of Paul Wells. But whenever the director would say, all right, cut, I'd be like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Norman. I, you know, I didn't really mean to be like, like I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I hope I didn't really hurt you or anything, you know. You, you need anything, you good, man? You know, we're just acting, right? You know, yes, all right. Yeah, I, I got a soft spot for, uh, for Daryl Dixon. Was that your, was that your girl? It was she. It was she. So sorry. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. It's hysterical. <laughs> I mean, it's not hard to, to be really fair, though. So. <laughs> Actually, on that note, though, yeah. were, were you kind of at the end rooting for yourself? You're like, oh, poor, poor Paul. Oh, for sure, poor Paul. Yeah. I mean, I, I do like how he went out, though. You know, he went out like a, like a champ. He went out swinging. It was you know, one of the most iconic deaths, I think, because that whole scene with Wells kind of has its own arc. He's on top of the world, he's leading all these zombies, no problem at all, communication with his team. Yeah. And then, of course, Maggie and me and cheat. <laughs> yeah, like, come on, man. Like, the man. Like, show your faces. That's what okay? it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm out here with, you know, I mean, we I'm out here showing my face. And, yeah. You know, I'm not trying to blend in with the horde of walkers, so why don't y'all do the same, you know? That's cheap. Yeah, let's have a fair fight. You know, but yeah, unfortunately, Wells ends up getting taken out, but I, I do like how he got taken out. If Wells is gonna get taken out, there's no better way, way to go. Yeah. yeah. Then for Maggie and Negan and the horde of walkers to, to get you? Just do it. No better way to go out. No better way to go out. Than all do you guys agree? Like well, Maggie and Negan together. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't hear that. <laughs> we had another coffee today. <laughs> no, oh. I hated it because I loved Wells. I didn't want him to go out. Oh I man, didn't. see, I love that. Round of applause for that comment. <laughs> for that lovely lady who stayed last night. Yeah, I think for Washington, it was it was funny the the episode where it was at the, the season break. I think episode eight. I think when everybody's on the wall. On the day, it was funny because it was still still daylight out. I'm like, all right, so just imagine tonight, that whole field is going to be full of zombies with landmen. <laughs> <laughs> she is, if you want the mic, she's the star of the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's make some memories. <laughs> Come on stage and take this mic. <laughs> So just imagine all the, the walkers out in the field and it's gonna get lit up. Yeah, yeah, there's the same mines. landmines and fog and everything. But I, my Washington wasn't in that episode. So I think it's funny that as everybody's getting attacked by zombies, I just figured I was locked in the bathroom maybe like, oh man, these locks, we gotta change these. <laughs> Come out the next day and I'm like, ooh, something serious happened last time. But it did. <laughs> well, it's gone, everybody's gone, I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> well, how did you feel about your death? Well, so again, not, not getting the full episode before you get to read it and you know see where your character's gonna go. We got the final episode and got to read that. And Zach, who uh, was the, the tall bald reaper that was with me at the end with Leah, uh, as we're reading the script, we see that we're kind of walking off into the sunset. I think we were saying this on the, the reaper tour, but it's just kind of funny that I'm like, I'm gonna live. I'm gonna live. But sure enough, Maggie had a much different plans. Not only shot me once, but again in the head. So I did not survive. But it's just pretty funny, like for the actor standpoint, to be reading that. Like I think I'm actually gonna make it. I'm so close. Yeah, I should have ran. I should have ran. You know what? I'm gonna look at that scene in a whole new way now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. oh. It was funny on, on the day for that. Uh, uh, Lauren playing Maggie, because you, know, you have to shoot different ways, and you never know how the edit's going to come out. So it's interesting to see what they choose, but 
on the day I was off camera, so I didn't have to keep falling every time that I get shot. And, uh, you know, Maggie's coming around looking tough, blood all over her face, and she's walking down with her gun. And I started zigzagging so she couldn't hit me, but I'm off camera. <laughs> and Lauren uh, doesn't skip a beat, just breaks character and grabs that big giant gun and starts going, <laughs> so fun. It was really sweet, and just Lauren just had a good time too. I probably shouldn't have been being serious, but it was, it was a, a little moment. Uh, so she too, yeah. 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 She has, she has you know, big actor energy, so she can, she has that privilege. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's really fun. That's the thing about like you know like being signed on to work on The Walking Dead. Before you know, before I was signed on to working on the show. Watching it, you're like, oh man, because they're the, the cast are such phenomenal actors, you know, they're, they're very talented and really immersed into the character that they're playing. So it's like from the outside looking in, you just, I don't know, you think that they're just serious all the, like they have to be serious all the time, like no games on set, but it's like the complete opposite. <laughs> they're like the nicest, goofiest, most, you know, funny, cast of actors to work with. Like, you know, like Ethan just said about Lauren, that's literally how they are. Like, as soon as you say cut, you know, it's all fun and games, you know. It's goofball. Right, goofballs. But I, I do feel like, you know, on a strategic, like from a strategic point of view, it allows us newcomers to like just be relaxed so that we can really get the character and feel comfortable playing the characters that we see ourselves, um, you know, playing the as. So shout out to the cast, you know, the, the, the regulars of The Walking Dead because Literally, they're, they're phenomenal. I, I promise, I'm not just saying that. Like, yeah. the greatest cast in that yeah. I've ever worked with. As soon as you walk on set, your family, and they really make you feel like that. They don't, they don't make you feel less than, or you know, like your role is any less than theirs. Seriously, like. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. The on that last day again to go off what Robert's saying is that I, you know, I'm sitting next to Norman Reedus, which is already crazy. It's Norman Reedus, right there. <laughs> but. You know, he's on his phone doing some work before we get going, and Jeffrey D. Morgan comes in. He's come, coming in like this with his hands. And Norm's like, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? And he starts going like this. These are my love punches, man. <laughs> and he's like, get going. I'm working. It's just really funny, though, to see that dynamic, because they've been at it forever, you know? Right. Just, just, it is a family. It's a family of people that just love what they do. Yeah. These are my love punches, man. <laughs> <laughs> That was a pretty good job. It wasn't bad. I wanted to talk a little bit about, before we go to you guys, if you have any questions, uh, I want you to explain to everybody, uh, Space Commander, Ethan. Yeah. Uh, what was it like to work on that as a lead? And uh, give us an elevator, elevator pitch for that. Yeah, How was your time on that? So Space Command, the, uh, the writers and directors is a uh, husband and wife, Mark and Elaine Zickery, and back in the day, Mark, at age 22, did a uh, the Twilight Zone companion, so he was just a huge Twilight Zone fan, and wrote this book as a kid, threw it out there, and took off, and all of a sudden he's this mid big sci-fi guy, and he did all these cartoons, this is not an elevator pitch, this is a 45 minute pitch, guys, stay tuned. But, uh, but yeah, they just had an idea to do their own kind of franchise. He worked on uh, Star Trek Next Generation, Babylon 5, so he has all these you know, sci-fi fans that know his work. And he's like, well, I'm just gonna make my own universe. So he made Space Command. Put a worldwide talent search out there and anybody in the world could try for two roles. And there's a Captain Matt Kimmer and a Cadet Bradbury. They said, I wanna be the captain, man, I'm gonna try that. So I tried it. Uh, they put it up on a website, you can kind of see everybody's audition tape. So you submit a tape and hope for the best. And as the, the weeks would go by, it dwindled down and went from like 3,000 down to 20. And I made the top 20, I'm like, oh cool. And it went to the top five, I didn't make the cut. So that, that was amazing to get that far. And I got a phone call from Mark Zickler, the director, he goes, hey, he goes, uh, we don't think you're right for Matt Cameron, but his great grandfather, what would he get now, age wise. <laughs> It is Captain Jack Kimmer, and it's like a, a story before. So they wound up shooting that one first, and I said, yeah, I'll go for it. And from that worldwide talent search, I got to shake their hands, like, well, what do you think about going to San Diego Comic-Con? Like, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's amazing looking, too. You were so, you looked so beaming. Nah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was just, it's along with a whole bunch of sci-fi greats. James Hong is in there. Yeah. Oh, Ron Tahir, Doug Jones, uh, Robert Picardo, 
Being the Furlan we just lost, I got to work with Michelle Nichols. It's unbelievable, but just all it is is just from submitting a tape and kind of crossing your fingers and hoping for the best and believing in what you do. And sometimes people will be like, yeah, welcome aboard. But it was really, really You're up. You're up. <laughs> yeah. Rob Well, speaking of sci fi, Robert also has a little something new, right? Just a little something. Just a little something. Just a little something. Um, so I signed on to uh, play the role of Lieutenant Pilot DeVille, which is the pilot of a uh, USS Ares Starship in the Star Trek universe. Um, the name of the project is Actionar, and it should be coming out sometime next year. Sometime next year. Thank you guys. Keep your eyes out for that. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a Star Trek independent, so um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Because, you know, when it comes to sci-fi and fantasy, whenever you're acting, you know, during the shot, you don't see what you're gonna see in post, you know, like all of the, the effects and whatnot is added to it. And it'll, it'll just be exciting to see me like piloting, a, you know, like a starship, because that's something I always envisioned and imagined myself doing when I was a kid. You know, so I'm, I'm very grateful to like, have a job where I can still be a kid and, you know, like, you know, kind of make a living off of it. You know, so, you know, thank God for that. Yeah, it's good to be able to check stuff off of this. Again, kill zombies. Kill zombies. Yeah. Raw space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just you know, it's very it's exciting for you because yeah. I, I know the production team that you that you're talking about, and they do bring in some big name actors. Oh yeah, from, yeah. We got some Star Trek. JG Hertzler. Yeah. Um, who else do we have? Richard Hatch, Tony Todd. Um, yeah, we got a few other. Star Trek actors who are part of it. And I'm like, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? I'm like the youngest one, and it just makes me feel <laughs> hey, like, welcome you board. know, like, this, is, this is cool, you know, just like being able to be in the same, um, in the same room as vets who were part of the Star Trek universe and whatnot. It just, it makes me feel really blessed and, and, and special, you know? So I thank God for that, and you know, I thank my team for it and everybody who, who was involved, because it takes a village. I, I feel like whenever I'm on set, I'm not the only person that's there, even if I'm the only one in the shot, you know, because it, it took many people connecting and pouring into me to get to where I am. So it's like a victory for everybody who was involved in that process. And that's how I'll always look at it. Like a crew of a starship. It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. It's like we're all up there piloting the Starship. It ain't just me, it's just, you know, it's, it's everybody involved, you know. Wow, yeah. what a bunch of nerds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but head over to imdb.com to check out that uniform. He looks amazing. Thank oh, you. yeah. The photos yeah. Still, for both of you, the photos look Thanks. awesome. You guys are safe. All right, everybody, thank you. Do you guys have any questions for the team? Go. So, it was kind of explained to us why Pope wanted Maggie so bad. And the way he explained it, she, well, Maggie, she said that all I know about them is they come in like by the time they come, you already did. We know they took their home already and she wanted it back. But he never gave a reason why he wanted her so bad. Like, he literally gave up his whole family that he said he loved so much <laughs> because I'm going to kill okay. Maggie. Why did he want her so bad? See, I don't know. I, I want to say I love the quotes that he loves so much. Because that's <laughs> love so much. Right. I was like, come on, you love, so much. you love us, but you're just going to send me out there to like, <laughs> hey, you love us, you love Boston. Right. So, I, why did he want Maggie so bad? He was hell-bent on killing her. I, I, feel, I feel it's because, because she was a survivor of something that we tried to wipe out. So I kind of see it as that she was always a threat. Maybe we didn't know her power, maybe we didn't. I learned the hard way very hard. <laughs> um, but yeah, I see it as that kind of thing. It's a threat that we didn't completely wipe out as the Reapers. So I'll it's always good. Job. Yeah, so I think it's something like, because he was on the high horse of like, I'm, I'm in charge here, I think he wanted to rid of that, is how I see it. It's a very big rival situation. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. It's for those who know. You talk about barn, farm, rental? Yes. Okay. Those, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Who else? Takira. I love you. I know. <laughs> yeah, um, not a question, but statement. I want you guys to cheer for like your friends ever again. <laughs> what was that? Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> she, said, she, said, 
Reapers, uh, each person had, you could tell they had their own personality. Did you guys get to create your own backstory working together at all? Um, because Richie Coster, what an incredible, as far as a leader, incredible actor to have as your leader. <coughs> did you guys get to improvise behind the scenes and just discuss where did you guys come from? And also, what are your thoughts on could, it, could there ever be a Tales of the Walking Dead or Reaper's origin story? Because that would be incredible. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, that's too bad. Yeah, yeah but, I mean, we, from the side of just like to be able to tell more Reaper stories, I think it'd be fun to kind of see, like, yes, we kind of touched on why we do what we do and where we came from, but it'd be cool to see an element of us in that action and to be, to drive the story. But yeah, uh, to go on like the, uh, uh, the building of the backstory, like a lot of it, all of the Reapers, like as actors, we just met each other on the day. And just based on our personalities, it's funny to see, like, I feel, I'm sure it all just kind of made their own thing, but but if we were to be ourselves, we would not be scary at all. <laughs> but it was, uh, I think it's all of us being together, kind of seeing the element that we have, building the story based on that first attack when you first meet the Reapers, and it shows, like, automatically that sets the tone so we actually didn't have to do too much work it's just the idea of like we're here to follow our leader he's in charge and whatever he says goes but yeah we shouldn't have followed him at all <laughs> <Whoops. Yes. laughs> so obviously at the end of episode not as in love maggie shot at the reapers killing two people letting leah live if maggie didn't do that do you think the reapers would have been back for revenge I just would have been gardening, maybe watching sunsets, you know, and time, and it well. just a little change in lifestyle. But yeah, we definitely would have came for it. Oh, sure. <laughs> After you would do the gardening. That's right. And that's the right answer, too, because, you know, since Maggie and Negan took me out, you better than that. Yeah, absolutely. Right? <laughs> yeah. Because we're family, right? That's right. For the Tudo Salutis. That's right. That's right. <laughs> This is the therapy catch, everybody. <laughs> I got a quick story I would like to share with you. Let's uh, The night before I filmed my, uh, you know, the, the big scene with Wells going out into the, uh, the woods with the horde of walkers. The night before, I started hiccuping. Right? I come down with the hiccups. But, you know, when you get the hiccups, you just, you know, maybe you eat too fast and they eventually go away like five minutes later when you stop thinking about the fact that you have hiccups and tend to go away. I go to sleep, I wake up the next morning, and I still have the hiccups. <laughs> still got the hiccups. But I'm like, it's all good, you know, I'm gonna eventually get rid of them. Get me some hot tea, some ginger and lemon, some breakfast, and they'll eventually go away. I get to set, still have the hiccups. I take them to my trailer. I still have the hiccups, and I promise you, I'm not making any of this up. I'm not making any of this up. This is a 110 percent true story. Um, they take me to hair and makeup, get all that done, get dirtied up. I still have the hiccups. They say, "All right, Robert, we need you out on set." I haven't told anybody that I have hiccups, right? Like I'm it's trying to, right? I'm in there, in, like in, in, the, in the makeup seat, like just trying to hold, keep it together. Like, yeah, I'm ready for this. You know, just really trying to keep it there because I don't want anybody freaking out about the fact that I have the hiccups. I get on set and I, I, I still have the hiccups. They end up calling a medic to set, trying to figure out how to get rid of, rid of these hiccups. So we um, I end up taking like five scoopfuls of peanut butter because supposedly that's a remedy of getting rid of hiccups. Right. Um, the cast and the, and the crew, like Lauren and, and uh, a few of the crew members, they uh, come up with this plan to like scare me, to like scare the hiccups out of me. <laughs> if that doesn't work, 
So we just go forward with the scene. And I kid you not, the moment the director says, all right, and action, the hiccups go away. I promise you, the hiccups go away. But as soon as the director says, all right, and cut, the hiccups come back. I swear, I put this on everything I love, I promise you. Um, so, you know, it's just funny how, I want to say the reason I had the hiccups is because, not necessarily because I was nervous to film a scene, I think it was deeper than that. You know, I grew up watching The Walking Dead, like in college. I grew up watching it, it was a phenomenal show, and I wanted to do everything I could to bring, you know, to, to bring my character justice and just to do everything to add to the story of The Walking Dead and not make the value of the Walking Dead decreased by my performance. You know, it was like the most important performance of my life, of my career. Uh, not because the the, the um, not because the aptitude of the show, but more so because the the personal respect that I had for it. You know, I just wanted to really, really do a you know not do it a disservice. Um, so uh, you know, I just thank God that I put the professional ahead of who I was. Because the professional women told me to like cut it out. You need to do your job. You got to show up for you know all of these actors on set. Like they're counting on you to show up to do your scene. And um, I guess that's what made the hiccups cut off. You know, so you know I'm just thankful that you didn't see Wells in there like. <laughs> you know, because that's what I thought. Uh, you know, the, the camera was about to get, and the editor would have. <laughs> right on. Hiccups out of the right. show. Yeah. I added a lot, so. <laughs> Personal connection. Our theory as a podcast has always been that the Reaper's arc was meant to be longer. Yeah. Than sure. Right? And that due to COVID restrictions and, the, and timing and all that kind of stuff and the show ending, that it got cut short. What was so, going to happen? What was meant to happen? Was it. You know, was there a, was there something that was thrown out there that this was going to go on longer, or? I feel like not really. I think because of how secretive everything is, because we have to protect every storyline. I think like we were actually kind of learning what we're doing as we're as getting we're it. Doing. Yeah. Sure. So even like when we first come back to the compound, we're dragging Daryl through to test him out. We go and it's a. Uh, Carver and Leah and I walking through the, uh, like when we first meet Paul, Boss is there kind of pouring out his heart before he became a uh, barbecue. Um, yeah, like even that, I, I didn't even really know like what the Reapers stood for. So like to, to piggyback on your question, like I, uh, we don't really know anything like what our art is supposed to be, what Pope is supposed to be. So I'm like, well, do we like Pope? He sounds like he's mean. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, she did not, but, uh, Richie Coster is a sweet, sweet man. Like just thick British accent, really nice guy, but it's neat to see him lock in because he brings a whole different level. You can see the homework that he does, and he would just sit in it, and you can feel it coming off of him. Like, Whoa, he's a different guy. But it's just amazing to see that kind of thing. But sorry, dude. question wise, I don't know. I don't know if we would try to push back and try to take over Hilltop more, or I'm not really sure, but what would we do to think that would be exciting? I feel like Robert has a theory, it's just like on the tip of his brain, but he wants to say it. I just, I just think they need to, you know, like sign us on a, an episode of Tales to explore. Yeah. 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 Let's not talk about it, let's be about it. Let's do something <laughs> about it, you know, and, and, and bring, bring this into fruition. I think that's what, you know, we should do because, you know, we, we have a lot of personality to bring to our individual characters, and I feel like that should be explored, you know? I, I feel like we have the, the capacity to do so, um, and, and you all deserve that, you know? I feel yes, like y'all deserve it. <laughs> you all love it. So give us a round of applause for our fans. Yeah. Yeah. We'd love to see you all there. Yeah. You guys and we see. would if we could. Just watch repos, right? Mm. But, all right, guys, thank you all. Before you leave, this is camp, right? We're family, right? Yeah. And I will not address me. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. And Ethan and, and Robert, these are two of Ethan's guys. Um, Robert, my daughter.